sorry. Hello. Uh, my name is Bob Phillips, and uh, I'm president of the World Mission and a pastor of the First Baptist Church in Marydale, Maryland. And I have my friend uh, Stephen Murphy with me today, and we're going to uh, to do an interview. And uh, we want to share with you folks uh, about his ministry in uh, in Northern Ireland. And uh, we go back a good ways. Uh, several years ago, we we were at a ARPA conference, and I met Stephen and asked him to come to my church. And his children lived in Virginia, and still do. Uh, with the grandchildren. With the grandchildren. <laughs> Don't want to leave the grandchildren out. So, so we uh, we went to our church. We had a great service, and he did a wonderful job preaching. And our people really got to love him. Now, we didn't plan this, but we had a really, uh, we, we, you know, Murphy's Law kicked in while he was there. <laughs> in a positive sense. <laughs> in a positive side, because uh, my girl that sings primarily in our church is named Loretta Murphy. That's, so we had Murphy's all over the place. Because Murphy's Law was doubling down. It was doubling, that's yeah. right. So, so we had a great time, fellowship. And then we, uh, we had some uh, castle conferences scheduled in Scotland. So we were in uh, uh, Melville Castle in uh, Edinburgh, and we went to uh, Kilrock Castle in Everness, and we went to the McDonald Clan Castle in um, on the Isle of Skye. And so, and while we were there, uh, Steve wasn't there for this, but we went over and met uh, Pastor Kenny McDonald, who's with the Free Church Continuing, a friend of ours. But uh, now Stephen came over and flew over from Ireland and preached for us in uh, Edinburgh. I, was, I think it was the first of the castles. Yeah, yeah, first one. I couldn't do the other, so I just, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember, I remember that, yes. It was a yeah. very unique experience. Yeah, is it the first time you preached in the castle? Yes. Me too. Uh, and <laughs> so, I didn't even preach that night. I, so were, something had to happen. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, so it, it was a real experience, and the castle we stayed in was really, really a beautiful, gorgeous place. Yes, they were very hospitable and took good care of us. Yeah. yeah. So, so what I want to talk with you about today is after we roll with some background things. Sure. Uh, I I know you've got a difficult word in Ireland because of the uh, predominantly Catholic uh, religion there, and so I, I just wanted to share with the folks uh, a little about uh, mm -hmm. what your ministry is, how it got started, and, and, and just how things have progressed. Well, both my wife and myself were converted to the Lord in 1980, which was the same year we got married. Both of us are from a Roman Catholic background. Uh, in fact, nearly all our church members are converted from a Roman Catholic background. And the community in which we serve the Lord is predominantly Roman Catholic. Um, now, when we were converted way back in 1980, uh, it was extremely difficult. Uh, most people thought we'd join some sort of a crazy cult. They'd never heard the term born again. They thought we joined something like the Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormons or something like that. So a lot of resistance initially from family and friends. Um, and it was hard to take on an emotional level. Sure. It was hard to take. Uh, and yet we knew that to follow Christ, if necessary, we had to accept the reproach even of family. You know, he makes that quite clear, doesn't he? Unless a man is prepared to take up his cross. Kind of be my disciples. Just reading that actually uh, this morning in my morning reading, coincidentally, <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't say coincidentally, providentially. <laughs> providentially, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we experienced that firsthand, right. you know, the, the emotional cost. Now, it was emotional. There was, we weren't sort of thrown out of our jobs or thrown in prison, so I don't, I don't want to magnify right. too much, but right. it was really it was, it was a tough emotional cost at the time. And what we found, Bob, was that over the years, just maintaining the relationship from our end, regardless of what they would say, just keep loving them, keep loving them, keep loving them. And eventually you could see the, the thaw coming in, the, the ice begun to melt, yeah. the hearts begun to melt. And uh, I had the privilege um, of seeing my mum come to know the Lord shortly before what she died. Amen. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, and we're, it's still, it's still difficult. It, the difficulty really changes over the years. With all that's happened and the scandals in the Roman Catholic Church, particularly with regard to the child abuse, and I know you've, you've tracked that from this. Oh, yeah. It's happened over here too. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, over here the Catholic Church is just one church among many churches. Over there, when people talk of the church, they mean the Roman right. Catholic Church. It's so predominant. Just it's like a massive mountain towering over society. So the 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 shock, the hurt, the disbelief when all this stuff began to come out uh, was extremely difficult. Um, but it has it has kind of loosened considerably that hold that the Catholic Church had over people's minds, that they could not conceive of leaving the Catholic Church. And now, um, a, a lot of them think, but did, did you leave because you discovered this stuff all that? <laughs> no, we didn't discover all this stuff. But what we discovered was that it was wrong in other ways. Uh, and, and it gives us opportunities to say, well, for example, the, the authoritarianism of the Catholic Church really opened the door, if you think about it, for some of the abuse and certainly for the cover-up of the abuse. And we, you know, I've been talking about this on the radio in Dundalk. And I said, look, at, Jesus didn't design the church to be this way. He said, you know, the, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but it shall not be so among you. He, he deliberately designed the church to be a loving community, not an authoritarian power structure. Now, let me ask you something I've, I've been very curious about. Um, wh why do you think that, um, wh why do you think it is that, that the, well, I know in Scotland what it is, that the, uh, the church there, with John Knox, I guess, predominantly, and in, in, in being a Presbyterian and Calvinist, and, and, and it's, it's retained that, that same type power structure as far as numbers of uh, being Presbyterian. In England, I guess it's uh, probably more Protestant than the other two. Well, I mean, you, you officially, both in England and Scotland, the Protestant Church, Anglicanism in England and the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian Church, are the established church, state supported church. But the irony is that only a fraction of the population actively identify themselves with it. Whereas over here in the United States, where there's no established church and you have complete freedom of religion, there's a much higher church attendance that's interesting that that you know that the uh, the route that america took of, of guaranteeing religious freedom was good for both the church and the state i think mm -hmm. now there's tensions there yeah. of course there's problems but i think history has vindicated the founders of the united states right. uh, in, which incidentally the baptists had a as you know yourself had a critical oh, yeah. input in, in the thinking of, of jefferson who was no baptist but uh, he had communicated very strongly with the Baptists in Virginia uh, and Massachusetts and became convinced that they were right on this idea of the right. total separate sphere for the church and the state. Which is where we happen to be right now, Massachusetts. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, um, the, the other question I wanted to ask you too about um, the Ireland in particular, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm a big David Faraday fan. I, I tried to look as sloppy as I could and, like he does, you know, it's yeah. tied over here. Well, I don't know about you tie you. You caught me on the hop for this interview. Yeah, so it was a quick, a quick response. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I was gonna, I was curious as to why do you think it was that not Presbyterianism, not Anglicanism, mm -hmm. but but uh, the Roman Catholic Church happened to become so powerful only in Ireland. It really goes back to the history of the relationship between Britain and Ireland. Um, and the English crown sought to establish dominance over Ireland from way back in the early medieval period. The interesting thing is, this is one of the great ironies of history, that Ireland was granted to King Henry II by the only ever English Pope, <laughs> Pope Adrian. He granted Ireland and, and, and required the Irish to submit to King Henry II, and the, Henry II was given the job of bringing the Irish church into full conformity with Rome. Huh. Because the Irish church was, the original Irish church was independent of Rome and re retained a large autonomy going into the 12th century. And Rome didn't like this. And so they commissioned Henry II to bring the Irish church, which he did uh, under conformity with Rome. But of course, by doing that, by giving the, the, the state power over that it, it came back to bite them under Henry VIII when he yeah. broke with Rome right. he had the power then to uh, to break the link between the Church of England and Rome he tried to do the same in Ireland but because of the tension between England and Ireland people used their Catholicism as a way of defining themselves against the English 
So it, it, it came to be that to be Irish was to be Catholic, to be English was to be Protestant. Mm -hmm. was, was it as much political as it was? Religious? Very much political, yes. Yeah. Um, so that even in, in the troubles which thankfully have, have finished in Northern Ireland, to be pro-British was to be Protestant, to be pro-Irish was to be Catholic. The terms Catholic right. and Irish were used interchangeably. The terms Protestant and British would yeah. be used interchangeably. What, what, what brought about that, um, that enmity between Ireland and England? Was it political or was it religious? You know, well, it, it was, it was political just, initially because yeah. I mean, England was the dominant power. And you know, in every situation, the dominant power will try and use the other, the smaller power, uh, you know, colonize and uh, make sure that no other power can use them. Uh, England always feared Ireland as being the back door for invasion of Britain. Mm. And, and with some justification, I mean, the Spanish tried to do it, uh, the French tried to do it under Napoleon and so on. Uh, so the English felt that they needed to keep a hold on Ireland primarily to guard their western flag. You know, Ireland is to the west of uh, of, of the island of Great Britain. The French describe it beautifully. They describe Ireland as une île, une île derrière d'une île, an island behind an island. And that describes it geographically, but it also describes it strategically. So whoever would control Ireland controlled the western flank of Britain. Oh. Um, and and it, 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 that was so up to the Second World War uh, that the, the, the British really required uh, and were very annoyed when the Irish, who had gained independence at this stage, wouldn't give them back their ports so that they could use them to extend their power westward to stop the U-boat attacks right. on the transatlantic convoy. So from the 11th century right up to the middle of the 20th century, mm -hmm. yeah. the issue was, it was a real issue. Wow. Now, uh, Sorry for the history. No, I, I, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. I, I, want, I think if people understand the history, they can understand the religion. Yeah. Better. Um, the uh, now the, the the other thing I want to ask you about is uh, I, I I read and, and heard that uh, Ian Page has just died very recently. Is that is that true or? Uh, well, if he has it since I came over here, yeah, I know he'd been very critically ill, and maybe if he has died it since I came over here, so yeah. I, I can't really comment. Well, on. I don't know. I, I may have misread it, but I know that he was. He was Ill. very ill. He, he had yeah. major heart problems. So, yeah. so he's probably not going to live very much longer, I would think. But the reason I asked that is I know that uh, it, it was a horrible thing when the, the war was going on in mm -hmm. Ireland for years mm -hmm. and years now. Mm -hmm. and the IRA and the bombings. And, mm -hmm. and I, I remember the, the last bombing. One of the last that happened mm -hmm. was this innocent little boy that got, got blown up and killed, and he had a kind of a, a real unique effect upon both sides. And uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, that's over, thank God. Uh, mm -hmm. is, um, is, is that related to the religion in the country? Can you see a difference in the religious structure now uh, that it's in? I mean, I think slowly it's beginning to. Um I think with exaggeration to say it's healed. Um, it's more of, well, they're not, they don't see the need to attack each other militarily. They've come to an agreement whereby they can live together. They don't particularly like each other. Yeah, like, like we are in South Carolina. <laughs> the, the, well, I don't the, to say that. The, the Yankees and they basically did yeah. like You can live together. You don't have to like him, but right. you can live together. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose that's better than killing each other. Yeah, they've been. Uh, so, but, but what we're hoping for, because I mean, the, the Bible Belt of Ireland is Northern Ireland. Right. That's where, where the predominance of the evangelical church is. That's interesting are. because the Bible Belt of the US America is, is, South. Greenville, is South Carolina, my state, and, and they always said the buckle on the Bible Belt was Greenville, my hometown. There you go. So we got somebody coming there. <laughs> so um, we're hoping that gradually. The, it's, it's like you've got all the evangelicals are bottled up, or the most right. of them in the northeastern corner of the island. That as 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 the enmity breaks down, that, that they will you know go out and, and evangelize the rest of the island. Well, how how has your work the last couple of years grown as compared to when you first began the church? Well, it has grown slowly, and I'm, you know the emphasis is on slowly. We started off with eight members. We have currently um, I think it's twenty nine or thirty. 
uh, I had the records with me, I could tell you exactly. But, uh, and it's gone up and down over the years. Um, I think our biggest encouragement is to see a number of people grow and take responsibility in the church, the opportunity which the, the radio ministry affords as we started that six years ago. The local community radio has given us a slot each Monday evening for one hour to preach the gospel. That's great. Absolutely. That's, that's unusual. Isn't that's it? very unusual. But, and it, as well as that, it, it, it's, it's given us a lot of contacts because it's, it's a community-run station. So we get to know all the guys who are in it. Oh, that's great. Very well. Yeah. And, um, you know, get to share the, the gospel with them too. Amen. Amen. Well, we're, uh, uh, we, we're going to certainly be praying for you and your ministry uh, as, as it continues in the future. Uh, is there any, uh, tell me about the reform work, Baptist mm -hmm. Calvinistic work that's going on in Ireland? I, I mean, it's encouraging at the moment. Of course, historically, the, the Baptist work in Ireland was an offshoot of the English Calvinistic Baptists. So that's, that's our heritage. Now, uh, over the years, a number of the churches would have the good thing about Irish Baptists is there was never a, 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 a liberal element there, or, or, or even any significant charismatic element. They were always conservative evangelical. But there was a stage there when there was sort of a suspicion against Calvinists, a bit like in the Southern Baptist Convention. It's here too, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, you know stereotypes, oh, well, if, if, if you go in a Calvinistic direction, that'll kill evangelism, it'll kill right. mission. Well, the greatest missionaries have always been Calvinist, William yeah. Carey, and so on. So I think it's a work of education, and there's a number of conferences uh, have come together to to really, in a non-threatening way, let people know. Well, this is actually our our heritage. This is this is you know we're, we're not hyper Calvinists. We're evangelical Calvinists. We love the gospel. We proclaim the gospel, and we have reason to believe in the effectiveness of the gospel because we believe in the sovereign stands over his work and performed. Amen. Yeah. You know, the, um, you and I are 1689 confessional Calvinist, mm -hmm. and uh, I, it gets so frustrating sometimes because you've got so many, you've got, you've got now so many flavors of Calvinism, and you've got the, uh, the New Covenant Calvinist, you've mm -hmm. got the Charismatic Calvinist, mm -hmm. uh, you've got the, the New Calvinist, which mm -hmm. are uh, they're kind of a hybrid, uh, uh, together for the gospel, for instance, uh, is, and I have friends in, in that movement, but, but I read their bylaws very carefully, and, and they're not 1689, they're not, as we are, what I call pure Calvinists. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in their position paper on um, salvation and soteriology, they say that faith must come before regeneration, which is totally an Arminian position. And well, it takes faith to work, doesn't it? It does. And, and here's the, the thing that really, well, I didn't sleep the night I read this. <laughs> it really upset me because I'm real big on doctrine, I think. Yeah, I preach yeah. a lot of doctrine because yeah. if you don't keep your doctrine strong, uh, yeah, yeah. Then, then you can go in his rich. But they said that if you put regeneration before faith, like, of course, R.C. Spohr and and uh, all, all the great doctrinal confessions and, 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 and all the great, even, even Spurgeon, then they said, you're not even preaching the gospel, that's not the gospel. So what they said, did when they said that, and I noticed R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur haven't been on the program since then, hmm. but when they said that, I, I just had to, I separated from them in our spirit because I didn't believe that was yeah. the truth. I, I'm not directly aware of the group you're talking about, but I'm surmising that it may be a confusion over the free offer of the gospel, which we believe in. Mm -hmm. We invite people to faith, but we know that faith itself comes as the gift exactly. of God, as the first fruits of regeneration. Right. And that, that was the point I was trying to make, is yeah. that uh, we, we are called many times who believe in the 1689 traditional confessionals of faith down mm -hmm. through history. Uh, we're called hyper-Calvinists. And, and, and over here we are. 
And um, so I, I just, uh, I want to make that point. Like, <laughs> we're not hyper <laughs> We're not hyper -Catholics. We do evangelism. <laughs> uh, we, we preach the gospel. We witness to everybody. Yeah. And we just believe that God saves people himself totally, holy, uh, without man's help at all. Which if he did, none would be saved. None would want to be saved. That's right. That's true. Well, I, I had a, I had a, I had a, Pet peeve, I wanted to get on my chest before, <laughs> before, I, before we quit. Interview. <laughs> well, it was good to talk to you again, you too, brother. brother. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll continue to pray for you and your ministry. It's good to renew fellowship. And whoever happens to see this video, we, of course, can't close without saying to them, if you haven't done so already, turn to Jesus Amen. and he will save you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Okay.